Now today we're transitioning into holiday mode and this year for Thanksgiving, we're gonna make turkey like an Italian. We're making turkey like a porchetta, a turchetta, if you will. So let's just jump right into it. Now keep in mind that this recipe is a two day process. So like most Thanksgiving turkey recipes, we're starting this the day before Thanksgiving. Now obviously a porchetta is a small pig deboned, seasoned with herbs, rolled and roasted. When it comes to applying that method with a turkey, it, to me it just makes sense. And before we get into dealing with the turkey, we're gonna deviate from the norm a little bit and turn all those porchetta seasonings and herbs into a porchetta butter, if you will. Now to the blender, we're just going to sort of break up some herbs. I'm gonna start with rosemary, which is gonna be the predominant flavor of the herbs. But I don't wanna go too crazy with the herbs. I don't wanna overpower the turkey with just herb flavor. We're just gonna toss in maybe one huge stem of rosemary. We're just going to be rough with it. Then we're gonna go in with a little thyme. These are all just essential Thanksgiving flavors. So for this turkey porchetta, we're gonna go that route. Some sage, we're just gonna pick off a few leaves. Again, I don't wanna overpower the turkey with just sage flavor. So five to 10 sage leaves should be good. Again, this isn't a stuffing really. We're not trying to stuff the inside of the turkey with stuffing. We're trying to season it lightly. Then I'm gonna go in with a light amount of fennel. Fennel and pork re work really well and it does with turkey too, but again, I don't want it to overpower it. So I'm just gonna take a teaspoon of the fennel and add it into the herbs. Then we're gonna go with about four cloves of garlic. Smash them, remove their papers, and get them into the food processor. And then just some red chili flake if you like some heat. And then we're just gonna get that and blitz it so that they're all sort of the same texture. To that, we're gonna add about six tablespoons of butter. Since the turkey breast is lean, this is a way to add fat back into it. To that, I'm gonna add the zest of one lemon. Some fresh cracked black pepper, and then just a little bit of salt to season this. The main bulk of the salt we're going to add on its own. Now just get that all blended together, and then when it's done, give it a taste and see where you're at. That tastes nice. The turchetta butter is ready. Now let's handle the turkey. Now let me tell you, I forgot I had a wedding over the weekend, which really jammed me up as far as my schedule goes. So I had to push my schedule up, scramble to find a turkey in less than 24 hours, and my guy over at Mino's Prime in less than 24 hours overnighted me this beautiful fresh turkey that I can use for this recipe. So if you need your meats, including a turkey, Mino's Prime is a good option. I'm gonna leave a link down in the description. Now I'm going to divide this recipe into two videos. Today's video is going to be handling the breast meat, but I am going to remove the dark meat and save that and prepare it in a separate way, which will be covered in a video on November 15th. So let's just go ahead and remove those first. Here's the deal. I wanna take these legs off, but I need to maintain as much perfect skin on the breast as I can so we can roll this in that skin. So when I go to cut this, I'm gonna cut as, as close to the dark meat as I can to make sure I get all of this skin usable when I roll the turchetta. Then you wanna grab both drumsticks and hyperextend them to pop the joint out of its socket. Then separate any remaining skin and then turn the bird upside down. And you wanna use your finger to find the delicious oyster meat on the backbone. Then you wanna take your knife and cut under and around the oyster meat to keep it intact. And then along the body until you hit the dislocated joint so that you can easily slide your knife in between the two joints to release the leg and thigh in one piece. And you can go ahead and repeat that with the other side. Next, we can take off the wing, which is sort of like the armpit. So you wanna take the tip of your knife and just sort of slice open the skin and work your way until you can see the joint, which is sort of depressed inside of the bird. Then use your knife to sort of cut in between the two joints until your knife can slip in between the two and release the wing in one piece. And then go ahead and repeat that with the second wing. Next, we wanna remove the skin. We just wanna pull it away from the breast meat, which is connected by a membrane, which you may need to use a knife at points to just release. Always remove the turkey timer when it comes in a turkey, and then just carefully go through, ripping off the skin of the bird in one piece. If I flip the bird over and remove some of the skin on the backbone to use just in case I needed it, but I ended up not using it. So you can remove it if you'd like, or just keep it on. Now, once we've removed the skin from the turkey in one piece, then we can go ahead and remove the wishbone, which is sort of like the collarbone of the turkey. 
So where the neck was removed, we're just going to find the bone, slice on either side of it on both sides so that we can slip our finger underneath it and just sort of release it from the meat. And then we can go and grab the top of the wishbone and just pull it right out of the turkey. And finally, we can remove the breast meat. I'm just gonna pick one side and take my knife and make shallow cuts running along one side of the breastbone. Then I'm gonna go back and make an even deeper cut and just use the breastbone as a guide for my knife, keeping it against the backbone to remove as much of the breast meat as possible. And once the breast meat is released from the breastbone, then we can come around the underside of the turkey, release it from the backbone, and then repeat that with the second breast. And if you struggle with this or you're nervous about it, you really just wanna start and go very slow. The slower you go, the more it's going to make sense when you're actually in the moment. But it's really not that difficult Difficult. And once you've done it a few times, it's a cakewalk. You can even practice and utilize this technique with a chicken if you'd like. Basically the same thing. And so once that second breast is removed from the carcass, you're left with a beautiful carcass that we can now use to make an amazing stock. And now we have two beautiful breasts ready to turn into turquetta. I'm just gonna transfer these over here for now while we work on the skin. Essentially, we just need to get this skin trimmed up of any excess fat. I'm just sort of situated so we can figure out how we're gonna roll this thing. All this is just some excess fat that we don't really want. But definitely be careful not to break the skin. This way, preparing the turquetta is highly influenced by Kenji Alt Lopez's Serious Eats recipe. I get one of the breasts on top and we kind of want to just open up the turkey tender. And then we want to just start making scores in the meat to sort of flatten it out into somewhat of an even shape and to create cavities for the seasoning to go into. And then repeat the same thing with the second breast. And then we're gonna go ahead and season the breasts with salt on both sides fairly liberally. We wanna make sure this thing is well seasoned. And then we're gonna go ahead and rub that porchetta butter all over the cavities, only on the inside scored part of the turkey. Then we're gonna set those aside and just sort of do some mental math on the skin. I want the best, most squared off end to be placed furthest away from me. And I got this little raggedy cut up end towards me that I can sort of work with. Then we wanna place the two turkey breasts so that they're just slightly overlapped on the skin that's closest to you. And make sure that the fatter sides of the turkey are oriented on opposite sides of each other. Then we wanna pick the side up closest to you and tightly roll it up keeping that skin nice and tight all the way until it's rolled up into a tight, perfect roulade or turquetta. Trim off any excess skin on the sides. Then we're gonna take some cooking twine and we're just going to truss it up. First in the middle, I just loop those ends three times and then cinch them tight. Then we're gonna work our ways to either side. Then we're gonna take a longer piece of string, tie it to one of the ends, and then just loop it under each tie all the way around the turkey so that it shapes the turkey so that it'll cook nicely and evenly. And here we have a beautifully prepped turkey in the style of a porchetta. Now we can just season some salt on the outside. It's gonna help dry out that skin. And then we can let that sit in the refrigerator overnight. Now, with everything else, we can make the stock. Now, look, I told you I was saving these thighs. I can't, I have to go to the wedding. I won't have time to cook these before I shoot the next video. So just imagine those are saved. Today, I'm just gonna throw it all into the stock because I don't have time to use it any other way right now. But on Thanksgiving, you're gonna wanna keep those legs in those thighs and confit them like we're gonna do in a couple of weeks. But for now, we're gonna toss them into a 450 degree oven to roast them off to develop nice dark flavor for a dark turkey stock that we're going to be making. Rotate them about halfway through and after about 45 minutes they should be nice and golden brown all the way around. Then we can take them out of the oven and get them in our stock pot. And I'm gonna use this 12 quart stock pot from Maiden. And I like the Maiden one because it's shorter than the normal 12 quart stock pot, which is perfect for a short king like me, or maybe your mom or your grandma. Now I'm just gonna get the carcass along with any of the dark meat, the neck, the giblets into the stock pot, fill it all the way up with water and bring it up to a simmer. And once it gets up to a simmer, there's gonna be all these particles that float up to the top and create this scum. And we just wanna strain that out whenever we see it. And as it simmers, we can now roughly chop some carrots, some onions, some celery, and some garlic. I'm gonna get that into the sheet tray that we roasted the turkey in. Then I'm gonna hit it with some tomato paste along with some random vegetable scraps from my frozen stock bag. Get it all mixed up. I'm gonna drop the temp down slightly to about 375 to 400 degrees and then toss the vegetables in the oven to roast. And while those roast, 
continue skimming the top of your broth, and then check on those vegetables, make sure none of the papers are burning or anything, and roast them until they begin to caramelize. Still clean in the broth whenever it needs. Once they begin to caramelize, then we can transfer them into the stock pot. And then I can take that sheet tray, pour some water on it, and with a flat bottom spoon or spatula, just scrape and deglaze that pan and then pour all those juices into the stock pot. Then we're gonna toss in some thyme, a little bit of sage, and a rosemary sprig or two, along with some bay leaf and some whole peppercorn. And we're gonna allow that to cook and simmer at a very gentle simmer for 12 hours. And this is what it looks like after 12 hours. The aroma is strong, the flavor's developed. We can just turn the heat off and allow it to cool and all those contents to settle to the bottom. Then I'm gonna take a double layered fine mesh strainer and strain that broth into the bowl. Once I get down to the bottom, I like to take some of the contents out of the pot so that I can easily just pour the rest of the stock into the strainer. And of course, you never wanna drop the strainer into the broth or you'll reintroduce all the particles you just strained out of it like I just did. Now we're gonna reduce this so clear broth isn't really the issue. We just wanna make sure we get those particles out of there. So I'm just gonna strain it again through a cheesecloth into my fat separator. Strain all those particles out, transfer them into core containers where we can label them and store them overnight until we're ready to use tomorrow. Now as a home cook, and especially to perfect holiday recipes like this one, one of the most essential pieces of gear that you're gonna need is a good wireless thermometer. Now there's this little line right here. We just wanna make sure we insert the probe into the turkey enough so that line disappears into the meat. Now the tip of that probe should be in the thickest part of the turkey. I'm gonna set it to 145 to account for carryover cooking. So there's all my data there. The remaining time estimate will happen once it hits the heat and can calculate when it'll be done. The turkey's warming up so we can pop it into the oven very soon. Next up, we've got the sauce. Now for Thanksgiving, I would use more than these two quarts of stock, but I'm just making a little bit and I told you I gotta go travel. So I'm just gonna make two quarts, but the way that I think about it is I'm gonna reduce each one of these quarts down to maybe a third of their current volume. And the way that I'm gonna thicken this is with a burr manet. It's flour kneaded into butter. The reason cornstarch slurries or burr mayonnaise even exist is because in a restaurant, you can't always afford to reduce sauces all the way down for a minimal yield. So they'll take a stock like this and flavor it to a point where it's delicious and then thicken it with something like a cornstarch slurry or a burr mayonnaise to get it to the right consistency. We're gonna do something of that today. Minimize all of the stuff that might dilute the flavor and just maximize on the flavor and quality of the stock with some butter and some thickening power from flour. So I'm just gonna take about two tablespoons of this unsalted butter, maybe three just so I have extra. Then I'll take about three tablespoons of flour and then just knead it together. At first I start with my hands just until that butter starts to absorb the flour and then I can sort of just smooth it all out and bring it together with a spatula. So now we're gonna cook the turkey and we're gonna do that in two parts. The first part is searing the skin. And we're gonna do that in the largest stove top pan that we can fit it in. Once the turkey is seared, we're going to place it into a 275 degree oven and cook it nice and slow. Now this cast iron pan has the largest surface area of a pan that I have. So that's what I'm going to use. And I'm gonna get the heat on high and cover the bottom with oil and let that get real nice and hot. And now I'm not gonna be able to fit this with the probe in, so for now I'm gonna remove it and once the pan's hot I'm gonna take the turquetta and place it top side down into the pan and I'm just gonna use my hand to press that into the pan so it makes really good contact now, this was about a 14 pound turkey enough for about 10 people and if you're gonna cook more I recommend doing two smaller turkeys because a bigger turkey is not gonna fit in this pan so now we're just gonna kind of roll it around make sure it sears on all sides till it gets really nice and golden brown and once we've got that golden brown on all sides and that skin is getting bubbly and crispy then we can take it out of the pan place it back onto the sheet tray insert that probe one more time and then we can toss it into the oven and allow it to slow roast while that roasts we can get a pot on the stove crank it onto high heat and then we can add in about two quarts of our turkey stock and I'm now just gonna let this reduce all the way down till it's about a third of its volume. Halfway through the cooking process, we're gonna give the turkey a rotate. She's progressing nicely. And now when it comes to the sauce, we're reducing it not down to like a glaze or sauce-like consistency, but to a viscous, flavorful broth. 
that still has a little volume to it. I'm gonna give it a taste. And when it tastes like something like you would find delicious to drink on its own, that's a good sign. We're gonna now season it with salt to bring out even more flavor. I'm just gonna salt it, taste it, and just work it until the seasoning is just right. Then we can take our bourmane and we can add about half of that mixture into the sauce for now and save the rest just in case we need it. And then with a whisk, we're just going to work that into the sauce until it's completely melted in. And then I'm gonna take some lemon juice and I'm gonna add it to the sauce to really bring out some acidity in the sauce. And now to activate that thickening power, we need to bring it up to a boil. And then when it coats the back of a spoon, it's the proper gravy consistency. Now we just added butter and flour, so we diluted the flavor. So we're gonna adjust the seasoning. And once it's just right, we're gonna let that sit off to the side. And now we're approaching 145, our target temp. So when it hits it, I'm gonna take it out of the oven and we can allow it to rest. I'm gonna reset the thermometer to 160 to monitor the carryover. Now right now, while that turkey is resting is when you would start to sear the confit turkey legs, which we're gonna cover in two weeks and then get them into the oven to crisp the skin and warm them through. That doesn't make sense now, but it will in two weeks. Then we're gonna turn the temperature up to 475 degrees. And we're gonna allow this thing to carry over cook until its momentum slows down. By that time, the turkey confit legs should be warm and the skin should be crispy, so you'd pull those out of the oven. And once that turkey reaches about 155 to 160 and has slowed down its carryover cooking momentum, then we're gonna pop that into that super hot oven to crisp back up that skin because that juicy meat now is weeping its moisture and can soften the skin even if you got it crispy. So one more blast in the oven right before serving is not only going to make the skin crispy, but since that momentum has calmed down, it's not gonna overcook it. So now that turkey has started to come down in momentum and almost drop in temperature, which is what we want so we don't overcook it. And now those turkey thighs and legs should be warm through and the skin should be beautifully crackly crispy. Now we're gonna pop this back in the oven to try and dry that skin out as fast as we can before we serve. Now we wanna roast it hard and fast, but we do wanna monitor the temperature. It's gonna kinda stay steady for a while, but then start to build back up. While it does, we can make sure we rotate that turkey so it browns evenly. And I can see the momentum is starting to speed up. And by now the skin is nice and brown, so I'm not gonna risk overcooking it. I'm gonna take it out now. The skin looks beautiful and crispy. I'm gonna reheat that sauce real quick, give it a taste. And I just think it needs a little bit more lemon. So to give it that real lemony punch, I'm gonna add a bit more. That's up to you, but it's a beautiful consistency and we're ready to plate. We can snip the twine off of the turkey, transfer it to a cutting board, and then slice it into nice thick rounds. And you can already see the juice kind of just pouring out of this thing. It's a real pain-free turkey. Just takes a little bit of know-how in the preparation and you have this stunning centerpiece. And for a little bit of a nice refined Thanksgiving plate, we're just gonna go with the gravy right in the center of the plate and just make a nice little round base for that perfect round of turquetta to sit on. Then place the piece of meat right on top and all your sides and even the turkey confit we're gonna make can all fit around it. But the deserving star of this Thanksgiving is this turkey in the style of a porchetta. Another turkey recipe that's in our holiday plan of attack that's gonna make you the star of your Thanksgiving. I think it's a nice little recipe. I'd love to know what you think down in the comments. This recipe is gonna be in my holiday plan of attack. It's an ebook I sell during the holidays every year that just condense all of my special family holiday recipes into one book. And it helps me pay for people who help me throughout the year. Link's gonna be down in the description for this and all my holiday recipes. That's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself.